history. Um, my first district was one that President Trump won by 19 percentage points, uh, and we came back in 2018 and won it by about 700 votes. So um, if you ever find yourself being discouraged or feeling like you're outnumbered, maybe it would help to think of that example. And there were a lot of other examples, of course, like that. But um, one of the things I try to tell different groups when I talk to them all around the country since that campaign is um, when we had the special election in March of 2018 and we had those incredible numbers against us, everybody from the entire country pitched into that one race. We had people sending postcards from California and New York, people chipping in online at $1 and $5 a pop, uh, people filling up buses in other states and bringing them to our district to knock on doors, even in the most rural and difficult parts of the area. Um, it was like the entire sort of pro-democracy community from the United States pitched in to help us win one race on one day in one place. And we did it. And we ne needed every single inch of help that we got from anybody. We needed. The race was that close. And, and I, I just always think for me, it's a, it's a helpful reminder that it takes a ton of work to win these elections. Like there's no easy way to do it. But when we do all pull together, we have a massive amount of strength, a tremendous amount of power on our side of the of the political spectrum. And, and in that race, we were outspent. I mean, we raised a lot of money and did a lot of organizing, but Paul Ryan's super PAC created its own separate campaign structure. So there were essentially two campaigns here that we were running against. They spent 25 million bucks, probably all in compared to less than 10 for us. Um, and we still overcame everything that they did with the help of groups exactly like yours. Some of you maybe even on this call were an example of what I'm talking about, people that were mailing in postcards and other forms of assistance. So. Um, we really, if we show up for each other and we adopt that attitude that we know it's hard and takes a lot of work and can be discouraging, but literally never give up, um, we're going to win more than we lose. And that's the most important thing. So, uh, you know, I, I am looking at 2022 as a difficult year for Democrats. I think we just have to be honest about that. Everybody saw what happened in the 2021 races here in our own state, in Virginia, in New Jersey. Uh, there are some swing voters that swung against us in those elections, and we need to figure out a way to get them back in the year that we have remaining for us. I think we have a path forward for doing that um, because Trump is only just now starting to reemerge and kind of remind people what the choice actually is and what the contrast actually is. And in a race like this, if you end up with a Dr. Oz in particular, you know, or even this David McCormick on the Republican side, he hired Stephen Miller to work on his campaign. I mean, these guys are going into the darkest parts of the Trump organization to look for votes. And, and we're going to show that to voters and we're going to have a real contrast with them. Um, what I think I offer you in this race, I know there are a number of good candidates and you've probably heard from the other candidates before. What I offer you that no other candidate brings is that experience of having to go out in these situations in Republican districts uh, and win enough votes to win. And we've done that three times in a row. Um, obviously, the lieutenant governor is from your county and, and he often talks about being elected statewide. I do think it's a big difference when you're the person on the ballot in the general election, which is not what he was. Obviously, he won the primary and then you vote for Governor Wolf in the general. Uh, and when you're the person on the ballot, they spend money against you. They attack you. They put all the negative advertising you know, against me and my name and my family. Uh, and we've withstood that. So what that means to you, what's relevant for your choice as a voter is I'm already tested. There's nothing new you're going to find out about me in this campaign. It's all been tried before and we've stood up to it. Uh, that is not true for the other candidates in this race who could be all attacked for a number of things for the first time. Uh, and you're taking a big risk with so much on the line in this race. I really do think this will be the most watched Senate race in the entire country. Uh, obviously we have a 50-50 Senate and our side is very committed to setting aside the filibuster. So everyone knows the stakes of one specific election are high. Um, but on top of that, Trump will be here campaigning. He has always felt uh, sort of personally at stake in Pennsylvania. He's come to my district in all three of my campaigns, campaigned against me by name, attacked me himself, brought the family members, the cabinet officials. So again, this is something I, I can offer you some experience dealing with this. And the most important quality is, you know, have you ever had to go out and really talk to swing voters, independent voters, even some Republican voters? and get them on your side. Uh, and I have had to do that to, to win originally and to survive. The entire room's full of them. Taking any question in the house, you know, dealing with hostile audiences, that's something, an experience that I've had to go through just to be in front of you right now. Um, so if you're looking for somebody who can win, not just in this May primary, but in November, 
that's a path I can offer you. Now, a lot of times people want to ask about, well, what, am, what are we getting from you? What would you be as a working senator? How would you vote? We don't want another Joe Manchin, that whole line of argument. I get it. Uh, I can also actually give you the most certainty of anyone in this race about how I would perform as a senator, because as a member of the House, I've already voted on every single issue of importance to you. We've held the House majority since 2018, and so we have voted on bills even that would never get taken up in the Senate, but we have voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour to protect a woman's right to choose by putting Roe v. Wade into law, no matter what the court does, to protect unions with the PRO Act, to protect voting rights with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, um, to address climate change, to allow uh, bargaining over the price of prescription drugs. I voted for Build Back Better. Um, I voted for you know, a number of, of issues that are core democratic priorities, uh, which will give you some certainty that you're, you're gonna get a vote for all of those things in the Senate. I'll vote the same way in the Senate as I did in the House. Um, and I've also learned some of the skills of being a legislator, working with people both to your right and your left, staying on an issue, you know, not just tweeting about it, but doing the long time work it takes to make an idea, become a bill, become a law, which ultimately is what this is for. So um, that's what I think I can bring in that campaign is the, is the mix of experiences, both of, of winning at the ballot box, but also uh, performing and, and voting in the job. So I'll stop there. And I hope if anyone has any question at all, or if you want to know more about a certain policy area, and you just want to say that, go right ahead. I'll be happy to answer it. Uh, do you want to say like anyone who has a question can just feel free to unmute and ask it? Yes. So do you support uh, Medicare for all or some other single payer healthcare system like most every other industrialized country in the world? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, and it's not because I disagree with the goal. Um, and I would actually even say to you that like the many European countries that do that, I think if if we got the chance to sort of physically rebuild our entire country and economy like they did after World War II, I think you would look at a system like that and it would make sense. Um, my conclusion is that here in the United States, I just think the, the insurance infrastructure is so integrated into people's lives. And my experience of, of representing, you know, a lot of people in sort of swingish areas is a lot of them want to keep their private insurance, whether you think they should or not. Um, they may not like everything that they pay for it, but, uh, you know, I think that to me, the record is clear. We're going to achieve the most progress on getting more people insured um, and actually affecting the quality of care that people receive if we continue to improve the Affordable Care Act. And I've tried to be part of that in a number of ways, um, but in particular with the American Rescue Plan, we made health care more affordable in this country than it ever was in the 12 year history of that bill. Um, in 2021, just because of what the rescue plan did with prices. So you don't think there could be a mix between uh, Medicare for all and private insurance? For example, some of the proposals have been to lower the age limit for Medicare and allow more people to participate. Um, because sometimes, the, even despite what you said, the Affordable Care Act doesn't cover everyone. Um, and isn't as affordable as it should be. Um, and prescriptions are certainly not as affordable as they should be. So, I mean, it, it seems to me that at least there have to be some other kinds of compromises. Um, I understand that insurance companies may not be going away, but even with Medicare for all, insurance companies can be part of that. So I'm still a little concerned about personally, personally, this is just me, uh, you know, about not supporting something like that. Yeah, no, it's a it's a legitimate question, and uh, I want you to know I am a, a very passionate supporter of of actual Medicare. And you know, one of the things I was alluding to when I talked about getting experience as a legislator working to your left and to your right, uh, I spent a whole big part of this year leading a coalition in the House with Pramila Jayapal of all people, the head of the Progressive Caucus, uh, to try to lower the age of Medicare. I I believe in lowering the age of Medicare. I, I don't. I, I'm just being honest with you when I tell you, I don't see that as really as a path to displacing private insurance or creating a Medicare for all type system. The way I looked at it more was I just know that if you sort of look at the lives that a lot of working people in this country are living, they're hitting the age of 55 or the age of 60 
uh, and going without health care in, in some cases or just delaying care that they otherwise would have to pay co-pays for or not be able to afford until 65. And it's a big problem. So I would love to see us lower the Medicare age at least to 60. Um, and actually, the way the math works, you know, our original bill on this, it kind of got changed once Biden came into office. If we would just allow Medicare bargaining over the price of drugs, that saves enough money in the government that you could pay to add vision, dental, and hearing to Medicare, and then also possibly lower the age to 62 or 60. You save a ton of money by allowing bargaining because we spend so much through Medicare and Medicaid on these drugs in the first place. So I thought that was a, a hugely popular, good government type bill where we'd be smart with your money, delivering real benefits to people. Um, and I still really, really want to push that because I think if Build Back Better gets stalled as it is now, you know, we may be in the situation where we have to pick some of the strongest elements to try to concentrate on going forward. And, and with, you know, the senator from West Virginia being one of the swing votes, it's a very elderly state, a lot of people on Medicare, we might be able to make some progress there. So, um, so I would definitely work with you on strengthening Medicare and lowering the age, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, I think when you look at that in a, in a system wide way, like that's the way you're going to change the entire health system. Um, I, I don't think the money works from the federal side because we would be spending a ton uh, from the federal side to try to do that. And you can see already the way we're running into sort of a ceiling on the on the um, public's appetite to spend. And the you know the, the healthcare economy in our country is somewhere around three trillion dollars every year, which is almost the size of the federal budget. So really, if you were if you were bringing that all under Medicare, eventually you'd have to be able to account for how you were going to pay for that tax wise. And I think, I just think that's a big lift personally, but. And people are paying it regardless, whether it's their coming out of their paycheck, they're paying for it for private insurance or whether the government's paying for it. I think there was a libertarian think tank that came up with uh, when they looked at the cost over 10 years, they found that a uh, trillion dollars would be saved overall um, on the healthcare system. I mean, healthcare expenditures in total would be saved if the if there was a single player a payer plan. I mean, so that argument about where are we going to come up with the money? People are already paying for healthcare. I mean, it's coming out of companies, uh, it's coming out of people's paychecks, it's coming out, it's already being paid for. So that that issue about it's going to cost the government so much is 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 really a non, we're all paying for it already. It's just changing which pocket it comes from. Yeah, no, I, you're right about that. And I, I wouldn't, wouldn't fight you on that one. And that, that was kind of why I was saying, I think if you were starting America over again, you would try really hard to do it that way. What I run into, and this is kind of consistent with what I was telling you about, I think this is a value that I bring to you guys in this race, even if we don't agree on every single issue. The way people tend to think about it out here in an area like mine, people I've represented, not, not just like Trump people, but just kind of average middle of the road people, I think at the root of it, I don't think they they have the same trust in governmental institutions that you might or interest in having a governmental sort of institution, you know, um, for, for lack of a better word, running this, whether it's direct provision or, or as a single payer type entity. And so people, I think, in their own minds tend to believe um, that when they're paying the premiums, when they're sort of choosing their employer, that they have some agency and some ability to retain the doctors that they like. Um, again, whether you can make a case that you would can preserve that in a Medicare for all type system or whatever, but I don't tend to run into a lot of support for that among the people that I've actually represented um, compared to talking about just doing things to try to address the cost and availability of healthcare itself so that they feel like they have more agency. Um, and I would say on a lot of these issues, you know, we should look at the pandemic as as an important lesson for our party. I think it's, it's most applicable for climate, but um, it, is, it is tough to get a lot of people to, to follow some pretty basic uh, advice or you know, just sort of adopt the mentality that, that what the government is telling you on something is something you should really agree to and follow if it involves some kind of sacrifice. It's unfortunate it's that way, but you know, just with basic things like masking, uh, it was so hard for so long to get people to listen to the authorities that I think you have to keep that resistance in mind when you look at something as large as, you know, this policy issue that you're talking about. So. So I, I don't want to hog all the time, but I, I will just say that I think the lowering the age of Medicare and just keep going, you know, over, over years um, and, and getting to Medicare for all that way 
Um, it seems seems like the, the best way to do it. The people do like Medicare. I mean, if you talk to my parents are on Medicare, they've had a ton of surgeries and all kinds of things. My in-laws uh, have been on Medicare. I mean, everybody likes that they, I mean, everybody that, that I'm uh, uh, re related to that is on Medicare likes Medicare. So you have a trusted entity already in government. They, I agree, they don't trust government. A lot of people don't trust government in general, but Medicare uh, does have a, a uh, you know, a lot of fans. And um, so if you just take, if you just lower the age, you know, to 60 and then to 55 and then to 50, I mean, it may take 20 years, 30 years, whatever, but it, I think you can get there through that. So, but well, I it sounds like you and I have common cause on that. So um, I definitely would would agree to try to work with you on that. We actually, Pramila and I went to the speaker's office, uh, Pelosi, and and basically begged her to put this in the House version of Build Back Better, and she refused because um, her team is so devoted to the Affordable Care Act. I think because they feel ownership over it that they look. She looked at the dollars as being one or the other: support the Affordable Care Act exchanges or lower the age to 60. Um, and so she turned us down, but we, we did extract a commitment from her that she would continue listening to us on the issue. And um, so it's definitely something I, I plan to keep on work. And I think it, you're exactly right that it is just a political home run. Um, even with very conservative people in our state who are at Medicare age, they believe that they've paid into it for 40 years and they're entitled to it. And I think it's a great issue for us. On another question for you, I, yep. the, the age right now is going backwards from 65. I mean, it's going, it's got that seven month uplift for every year after you're born. Like I was fortunate, I was born in 54. So I hit the 65, but now it's, I think it's going to be this year, it's going to be 66 in four months or something like that. It keeps backing up. Do you think that possibly we could stop that and, and take off the cap for Medicare taxes to help pay for that? I mean, would that be an alternative right now? Uh, potentially, yeah. Um, the uh, the area, you know, sort of similar where I've been a little more active. Um, obviously, I want to lower the age on Medicare, so I'm with you on that. But uh, we're really we're very very close to a House majority's worth of votes to lift the wage cap on the Social Security uh, part of the FICA tax. Um, you know, I think you guys probably know there's a there's a wage cap of about 140 grand on your Social Security contribution. So. If you're a millionaire, you stop paying Social Security around Valentine's Day every year. And our bill would really just for people at 500 grand and above, get rid of that cap. So you, you don't pay a higher rate. You just pay in the whole year as opposed to when you hit that 140 grand. And if you just did that, Social Security would be guaranteed and you'd actually get a larger benefit through the year 2100. Our bill is called Social Security 2100. And if you look it up, you can see a picture of me and AOC together at a press conference, probably the only one of those you'll ever see. Um, cause we agree on this issue, um, and have worked together on it. Uh, the, uh, the interesting problem that that solves is if you talk to a lot of older voters in our state, some of you might've even gone through this is you get the cost of living adjustment, you know, every year on social security, but virtually always it is less than or equal to whatever your Medicare premiums go up by. So you never feel like you're getting ahead. And our bill would finally address that the cost of living and benefits increase we would give would be so much bigger that that would not happen. So, again, political home run. I've been trying to convince Biden and everybody else that it's, it's a much better thing than some of these other, you know, ones that they that they push forward. But we'll have to keep working on it. So now, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah, too. And Connor, we I was told you had time for one or two more questions and that's it. So sure. what I'm, I'm good. Could, I'm good for I... another 10 minutes or so, but I don't want to I don't want to steal your oh, name. You guys. No, tell it's me all right. When. It's all right. Well, then, if you have you're good, I'd like to move off of this particular question. So if one of you guys have a question about another topic. Yeah, there's I'll... in the chat. Someone put student loans and yes. tracking. It looks oh, like so. Um, yes. So would you those real quick student loans? Um, yeah, I am an advocate for student loan forgiveness. I'm, I'm, if you're suggesting sort of wiping out the whole one and a half trillion, I'm not quite there, Blade. But I, I do think that if we, you know, Biden's proposal was 10,000 for everybody. I think if you pick a number like that, you do a tremendous amount of good. People don't always realize this, but a lot of the people who struggle with student loans the most are people who only went to a year or two of school and didn't finish. And then they don't get the benefit of the higher wage, yet they still have this debt hanging around. And so a, a 10 or $15,000 debt can kind of spiral 
a lot of control. So a 10, so So probably my biggest legislative accomplishment this year was restoring the methane rule that used to exist under Obama and Trump got rid of it. Methane is the biggest deal in natural gas because it leaks throughout the system and it's more potent than CO2 from a climate perspective. So putting this rule back into place and I got to go to the White House, picture of me and Biden, him signing it, um, meant that we would crack down on these companies for not having good enough practices and that we actually will get a a climate benefit out of this because if you look at it most of the most of the decarbonization that has happened in the united states so far has come from moving from coal to natural gas it's not always going to be that way in the future we're going to expand renewables even more and we're going to do a lot of other things to make more progress but that kind of first chunk comes from going coal to gas if you're leaking methane obviously you lose that benefit so we're really trying to preserve and, and protect that so that's kind of how i've been uh, active on it. I'll just keep going through these until somebody interrupts me. But um, the I have already voted for statehood for Washington, D.C., Alan, uh, twice, actually. Uh, we haven't voted on Puerto Rico just because I think there's a general sense that the will of the Puerto Ricans themselves need to be a little bit what, better established. I know they've had a couple of different referendums, but there are people who think we need to understand there. In, in theory, I could support it. I served with a lot of Puerto Ricans in the military, so it's very common sense to me. But I just want to make sure I understand what their views on it actually. Um, yeah, most of the rest of these are are comments. Oh, inflation and and prevent war with Russia. Ryan, Ryan you're really asking me the easy ones, huh? Um, look, inflation. We have to get these prices down some way or the other. The truth really is, is that it, it's a supply problem. It's caused by the pandemic, um, causing shutdowns in all of these other manufacturing and producing countries and OPEC not wanting to drill as much. So the Republicans want you to believe that everything is the fault of normal people, that if we wouldn't have sent people to money, money at the darkest days of the pandemic, we wouldn't be in this. Um, but the fact is, I wanted to help people when the pandemic was at its worst and nobody knew if they were going to lose their job or they'd be out of work for a while due to a shutdown or whatever. Um, and, and that really isn't the cause of it. The cause is on the supply side. And so the administration is doing a thousand things to, to free up space at the docks and uh, increase the amount of shipping containers going back and forth. They're getting more truck drivers on the road here. Uh, they open the strategic reserve for petroleum. They're pressuring OPEC and other countries to, to drill more for gas so that the prices come down. Gas prices have actually already started to come down since November, so we know it's working a little bit. Um, we just have to keep at it. We have to keep at it into the new year, and it is going to get better. But unfortunately, this is an issue where we just have to be straightforward with people that there is no silver bullet on the issue of inflation. It is another terrible thing caused by the pandemic, and we're going to roll up our sleeves and, and do everything we can to fix it. We're not going to politicize it. Um, Ukraine, I think, you know, we're doing what we can to try to stay united with NATO and, and convince Russia that the costs will be um, very, very high if they do what, what they're threatening to do. I mean, we could cut them off from the entire banking system. Um, we could shut down Nord Stream 2. We could really deal Putin a lot of economic blows. Uh, I don't think America really wants to send a lot of troops in in this situation. So those are our best options. Uh, and I think the administration is doing a pretty good job on it. Um, another issue with, with fracking, by the way, for those who are a little hesitant about it, just remember that our ability to export some of this natural gas plays an important diplomatic role in situations like this, where you want to be able to give Europe another supplier besides Vladimir Putin. Um, so that's, that's important to do. Um, And do we have any other hands up or did you all get your questions answered? So like there was a final question on general election strategy from somebody. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, okay. Sorry. I, so we are, um, I mean, clearly when you joined, you heard we were maybe licking wounds a little bit because we are in Northern yes, York yeah. County, uh, which is not a progressive area necessarily, but it is an area that saw 
massive gains um, over the last four years, especially comparing 16 to 20 uh, with the presidential. So knowing that this is not an area that's necessarily vote rich, like I've heard a lot of candidates say, what is your plan? Um, should you win the primary and be the general election candidate? Um, and I'm talking outside of the party infrastructure, what is your campaign's plan to engage with activists and organizations like ours in these regions? Um, yeah, first of all, I want you to know that from my first campaign onward, um, Indivisible and other activist type groups have worked hand in glove with me. You may not always think of that if your impression of me is based on the national media coverage, but I, I am very much a grassroots campaigner and a believer in the grassroots and what you do. And you will have access to Amy, who is our political director at the highest level, um, and you will always find a willing partner in us. So that's just a, an organizational piece. Personally, um, I just I really believe in on the ground, in person, old fashioned campaigning. And I think one of the things that I can offer you as a candidate is that I'm young. I've done a lot of this for the last four years. I will hit all 67 counties multiple times, any audience, any time, any question, any topic. Uh, and I think we win votes that way. I really do. I, I don't think there's a like a some sort of masterful, you know, magical political strategy other than getting out there and showing respect for people's views and listening to them, letting them know you're open minded and not as dogmatic as they may fear if they watch a lot of cable news. Um, and that's the only you can only do that in person. So you'll see a lot of me in your county and the surrounding areas fighting for every vote. You may think to yourself, yeah, he can say that, but it's a big state. You can't meet everybody. Um, I can meet more people than any candidate has before. I believe that about myself. So uh, I'm going to put us in a, in a good position to make some converts. And yes, Ryan, who asked about, I would support eliminating the filibuster if I wasn't clear about that before. So, so, so how do we get Mansion and Cinema to do that? <laughs> I don't think you will. You know, I mean, I they've, yeah, they've, I know. they've made their positions clear under a lot of pressure. Um, I don't understand. I mean, yeah, frustrating for me because there are issues where I can sort of understand if you have a different view of taxes or some economic thing that's a matter of degree, but the justifications that they offer for their position on the filibuster are so provably false in, in our history and in our current time that um, it's a very frustrating thing for me. I serve there and I care a lot about bipartisanship and the filibuster doesn't help us at all. Like it, it encourages partisanship because it makes everybody feel safe uh, retreating to their corners. So I actually think you'll get more bipartisan legislation without the filibuster because in Washington, when everyone knows that a bill is moving forward, they tend to jump on board, at least some people do, so that they can hang some priority. It happens every year with the defense bill. We end up doing 100 non-defense things in it because everyone knows it's gonna pass. So I think you'll see more of that. Lori's been waiting. Lori, do you wanna ask yes. your question? Well, I like Nancy's Nancy's question right there, um, honestly. But but mine was was similar, and I've said, and you've said twice um, in this talk that you've made the distinction that you are not a Joe Manchin. And what you know, my question is, why do you say that, and what does not being Joe Manchin look like? Yeah, all I was trying to to do was address. Um, some certainty for you about how I would vote. That's a question I get from a lot of groups. They don't want to feel like if they support me today to a year or two from now, some issue is going to come up and, and they'll be really shocked by how I vote. And all I was trying to say was I already have a four year voting record on all of these same exact issues. And we have voted on a million bills in the house that, that would also be brought up in the Senate if we get to the majority um, because we, you know, on all the issues I mentioned. And so I'm just trying to clarify for you that you don't have to worry as much about where I stand on the hot button things you care about. Cause I'm already on the record. I've already had to vote that way in a Republican or in a red district. So, I mean, clearly I was willing to go face my voters having voted this way. Uh, and that, that sets me apart from mansion and cinema on, on the grounds of our actual voting records. That, that was my only point. Thank you so, for being I, here and for no being problem. willing. No problem. I think I am actually out of time now. I have yeah. to do something at 3.30. So yes. um, thank you guys for giving me a forum. I, like I said, I'm a believer in in-person yes. stuff. So hopefully the next time you see me, it will actually be in person. Um, and thank you for everything you do. Don't. The only thing you can't do is give up. Do not give up. That's what they want. That's, they are sitting there praying that Democrats are getting their low morale uh, now because of all these things. And that's something we can control. So don't give up. Thank you, guys.
Hey, thank you very much, Connor. Thank you for taking the time and uh, thanks, Amy, and for arranging, helping to arrange all this. See ya. Yeah, see you. Okay, guys. Uh, uh, so what do you think? We, I think this is 